Thank you so much, Phil. You have made a lot of people envious tonight, most of them piano players. Beautiful. Thank you so much. What a talent. I uh, have nothing against that, that big pulpit we have. I have absolutely nothing against it, but every once in a while I like to, I like to go lean and mean. It makes me feel a little vulnerable and maybe a little exposed, but I kind of like living on the edge once in a while as well. And uh, it, uh, it, I'm a little slow. Even though we went to the same Bible college, I'm a little slow. Sherry and I both graduated the same year from Central Bible College, and I just learned that today. I've been dying to ask you all day, did I pick on you as a student? No? I, I, I was a jokester. Do you, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. These, I know you find that hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, have you recaptured the lost hour of sleep? No. And so I just don't think we ever quite do, do you? It's a, it's a little unsettling, and it makes for a long day and a short night, but here we are. And I'm really, really gl glad you're here tonight. And we are doing a three-part sermon series from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we began last Sunday night with the theme, No Condemnation, based on the first 17 verses, primarily the very first verse of Romans chapter 8. And tonight, we are looking in our second series at verse 18 through verse 27. And we're going to talk tonight about from groaning to glory, from groaning to glory. And then next Sunday night, we look at the, la the uh, last verses of Romans chapter 8, and the theme is more than conquerors. I've often said Romans 8 is good for whatever ails you, and it really, really is. It is a faith-infusing experience to read Romans 8, not just with your mind, but embrace it with your heart, and let it really register with you and speak to you. Let's look in Romans chapter 8 tonight, verse 18. The Apostle Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know, verse 22, that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So, Phil, your words have led right into this theme tonight. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans, there's that word again, that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Well, how are you doing? Well, according to the Bible, in a sense, not so well. Not when you read words like we've just read, words like present sufferings, frustration, bondage, decay, groaning, pains, and weakness. 
Does any of that feel familiar? But it's going to get better. I promise. Well, actually, God gives the promise through his servant, the Apostle Paul. Paul talks about two realms of existence, our current situation and our future anticipation. What we are, where we are, and where we are going. What's current and what's coming. What's present and what's promised. We are citizens of two worlds, this world and the world to come. So let's look at, first of all, our current groanings. And there are a variety of words that Paul uses to describe our present reality. I love Paul. The more I've got to know him, the more trustworthy I know he is. He is a realist. He doesn't sugarcoat or play games or skirt the issue. He faces reality, and he's not afraid to call it what it is, no matter how harsh it may be. Look at the terminology he employs to describe our present reality. He speaks, first of all, of our, our sufferings in verse 18, our present sufferings. Well, he's nailed it there, hasn't he? That's the world we live in. It's a world, like it or not, that is marred and marked by the fall. It's a world that doesn't play fair. It is a world that is no respecter of persons. It is a world where Christians, no matter how holy and devout they are, can suffer. Paul says, our present sufferings. So he's talking openly, honestly, truthfully, as a believer to believers, and he says, our present condition is one that includes the harsh reality really the inescapable reality of sufferings. And sufferings are never convenient. They're never polite or considerate. They're intrusive. They come without our permission. They don't make appointments ahead of time. They just show up, and they stay as long as they want. Now put yourself in the place of those who are reading Paul's words, those to whom he originally wrote. In Paul's day, if you were a Christian, you better expect suffering. Every epistle of Paul addresses the issue because every church and every Christian suffered for their faith. Many of them were ostracized by society and alienated by family, lost friends, lost jobs, lost standing in the community, lost family, and in many cases, lost lives. But we too, we too have our forms of suffering, don't we? In fact, it is really quite amazing, astonishing, in how many ways suffering can visit God's people. You never know what people are suffering. You never know what people are suffering. And many times we suffer for no other reason than we live in a world where suffering is just a way of life. Paul continues in verse 20, and he adds another word and another dimension to our suffering. He uses the word frustration, for the creation was subjected to frustration. You ever been frustrated? How many are married? How many have children? How many have a boss? How many have electronic devices? Well, Paul says the whole creation has been subjected to frustration. The world's not all that it used to be. It's fallen. It has limitations. There are malfunctions and breakdowns as a result of the fall. Things don't always work the way they should. They don't always work the way we'd like for them to work. The creation was subjected to frustration, he says. Boy, you can say that again. 
The creation was subjected to frustration. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, he adds even more words to this that are not pleasant sounding. In verse 21, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. That sounds dreadful, doesn't it? How are you doing? Well, I'm in bondage to decay. Not a positive con confession I would recommend. Carol and I just went back to Sioux City a few days ago where I had pastored for 19 years, many years ago, and it's always a, a fun homecoming, and we saw many old friends, and they are getting older. We're not, but they are. And you learn that there are three phases in life. There's youth and middle age, and you're looking good. And you know it doesn't mean what it says. It, what it really means is, wow, I can't believe you're still standing. <laughs> and, you know, it's just more the accumulation of additional evidence that we did not really need. But there it is right in front of you. We are all in bondage to decay. I wish Paul could have been more tactful. But if he had been more tactful, he couldn't have been as truthful and that's the words, the very words that he uses. Now, if you don't believe me, and if you don't believe Paul, young person, I want you to do something. Go home tonight, take a really good look in the mirror. Study the lines, the muscle tone, the clarity, and the firmness of the skin. Come back 20 years later and look again. And then, 20 years after that, why, you could look in the same mirror with the same lighting, but you won't see the same face. Not really. Those little lines are now deep crevices, and things have fallen out and fallen down, and there are spots and blotches and other things you picked up along the way. I don't know any nice way to say it. We are in bondage to decay. And then Paul adds some more words. He's on a roll, isn't he? Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been what? Groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. You know, I remember, I remember as a young, young boy hearing my dad groan when he would get up or sit down or lift something. And my young mind, was, I, I kept thinking, what's wrong with him? Why does he groan so much? I now have the answer to that question. I now hear myself groaning, just like my dad. I have turned into my dad. Not long ago, my wife was outside the bedroom, and she heard me groaning. And I'll admit it was loud. It sounded like I was in a wrestling match with Hulk Hogan. She said, Don, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm just putting on my socks. <laughs> Life is filled with groans, all kinds of groans for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes we groan in disappointment. Sometimes we groan in frustration. Sometimes we groan because of sheer physical pain and limitation. We groan in grief. So th this depiction of life is not really a very pretty picture by Paul, but how could it be? He spent chapters talking about man's sin and depravity. He's talked about how sin entered the world and death through sin. He's talked about the ugly side. I'm so happy to tell you that's not all he talked about. That's not all because it's not all. There's so much more to be told, 
And here's Paul's, not Paul Harvey, but the Apostle Paul's rest of the story. Not only the current groaning, but secondly, the coming glory. Look at verse 18. Now, he's already painted a picture for us in detail about our present reality. What he does now is paint another picture of our future glory, and it's every bit as real as our present reality. It just hasn't happened yet, but it's on the way. In verse 18, Paul said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Many Bibles have a cross-reference there, and they direct us to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And that's a good place to go. It's a parallel Scripture, and it reads, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Here's the point. The glory will be infinitely greater than the groaning. Now, this groaning, he says, capture what he says. He says it's to be revealed in us, not only to us, not only for us, not only around us, but literally in us. Just read it. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory glory that would be revealed in us. You say, well, I wonder what he's talking about. Well, he answers that very question. In verse 23, he gets more specific. He tells us exactly what he means. In verse 23, he says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. Our spirits have been redeemed. Our bodies will be redeemed. Our inner man has been renewed. Our outer man will be made new. It's part of the full redemption package. We now have a part of it, but the day is coming when we will get it all. What does he mean? Oh, I can tell you, he means this. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. What does he mean? I can tell you this. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on incorruption. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is writ written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? What does he mean? I can tell you this. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. And then he tells us this glory is already assured. And so, Pastor, how can you get up there and, and sound like you're so assured of this and speak with such confidence about this future glory, this unseen, unrealized promise? Well, I'm glad you asked, and it is a great question, certainly an important one. We have two powerful assurances that work in our lives regarding our future hope. Both of these acts and assurances are mighty works of the Spirit. The first one, we have the witness of the Holy Spirit in us. Look what he says in verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, sons and daughters, children of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself 
testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. One preacher of old called it the downreach of the divine. It's that witnessing of the Holy Spirit in our hearts regarding God's love and God's presence in our lives. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in my heart is a witness of the glory that is to come. The impact and impressions of the Spirit upon my spirit assure me that I belong to Him, and this body also belongs to Him, and it is appointed a day of resurrection, future glory. So the future, I mean the Spirit is constantly testifying that I am His child and my future is with Him. But we have a second witness, and that is we have the witness of the Spirit not only internally, and I wouldn't use the word subjectively because I think it supersedes that, but we also have the witness of the Spirit physically in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 11. He says, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Now, we Pentecostals like to claim this as a healing verse, and I think it has that application. But first and foremost, this is a verse that points to our ultimate healing, our bodily resurrection. And Paul is saying the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise you from the dead. His resurrection is a preview, a down payment of your resurrection. Your resurrection is as sure as His. You look back to His empty tomb and a host of post-resurrection appearances, and that is the foundation of your resurrection hope. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, you have no hope. But if Christ was raised from the dead, you have nothing but hope. And then he says, in verse 23 and in verse 25, we are to wait for this glory. I am not a big fan of that word wait. I don't like waiting. I'm not a good waiter. I just, I'm not. I never have been. I mean, I get upset if I miss one turn in a revolving door. And I believe God is trying to teach me some things through waiting. Waiting has certainly revealed uh, there's a lot I still need to learn in life. Do you know what the department of motor vehicles is like for someone like me? It is one of the most agonizing, frustrating experiences a man could have. I was there a few days ago, and I'm still suffering the after effects, still traumatized. I was getting my driver's license renewed. and. It, uh, there was a holiday that Monday, and so it was a four-day work week, and I knew going in the place was going to be busy, and, and it was. It was busy. It was, it was absolutely jammed, wall-to-wall -wall people, and my heart just sank because I didn't want to spend all that time there. And I went to the first station where you report in, and, and the gentleman in, in front of me was from another country, and the nice lady at the desk couldn't understand him, though she, she tried and she tried, and she just couldn't understand him. And I was so impressed by her kindness and her patience, and de de depressed by my lack of it. And, and, and I'm, I'm totally ashamed to admit this, but again, thank you for this therapy session. I appreciate it. I mean, I was, I was grimacing, I was gnawing at my knuckles, I was bent over in pain. They really should take away my ministerial credentials. They really should. <laughs> you say, man, I can see you doing that. That's, that really sounds embarrassing. 
Of course it was embarrassing. But what's new? You know, I'm the guy who asked the lady when her baby was due, and she wasn't even pregnant. (laughs) I'm the guy that went into the ladies' room at First Assembly because I can't tell the difference between men's and ladies. I'm the guy that got his tang all tangled and said a naughty word from the pulpit in one of the most straight-laced, uptight churches in the whole state. I'm the guy that wrapped my arm around the wrong woman in the sanctuary after church on a Sunday morning thinking she was my wife until my wife walked in and saw me with my arm around another lady who, by the way, was in a total state of shock. Three of us were in a state of shock. So listen, hey, I've gone through life with a red face. I'm used to it. And there I was, waiting, waiting, waiting. I just wanted something to happen. Please, anything, anything but waiting. I really don't know how I've lived this song along with this kind of constitution. And I was just there, and I was... Finally, the man with the accent was directed to another person, so I'm next, and I'm silently praying that no one saw me, and no one who did see me knew who I was. And I go up to the lady, and she says, well, hi there, I know you, I go to your church. (laughs) She says, I've got a copy of your book at my desk back there. How can I help you? I said, do you have a hole I could climb into? That would be a nice start. Actually, I honestly said to her, I stuttered and I stammered, and I finally said, you know, I don't go to church anywhere. (laughs) She said, oh, yes, you do. I got your book right back there on my desk. And she gave me number 76. I went over and I sat down and, you know, waited. They were calling number 42. (laughs) Twenty minutes went by, and they'd called two numbers. This was a Tuesday. I figured I'd be there till Thursday afternoon. (laughs) And my dear friend, this angel, I don't know what happened. I don't know if she saw the dark cloud hanging over my head or... or maybe God knew I was going to have a heart attack because she kindly motioned me over to the counter, and she got me out of there in 10 minutes. And I got to my car, and there was, a, there was just an interaction of emotions in that moment. I was relieved. I was thankful. I felt a little guilty that uh, I got ahead of others, but I can live with a little guilt. But I was feeling a whole lot of guilt for my lack of patience. And you ought to see that picture on that driver's license. (laughs) Holy mackerel. I look guilty. I look angry. I look like a convict that's been caught red-handed. So I'm sitting there in the car and I'm trying to process everything that just happened and my juvenile behavior, and I bowed my head, and I said, God, what are you going to do with me? And he said the worst thing he could have said. You know, if he'd said, I'm going to put you out of your misery, I'm going to let you have that heart attack you've been wanting so bad and working so hard for, I'm just going to let you have it, I think it would have been easier. Instead, he said, I'm going to teach you patience. I said, I know, Lord. I get it, but I don't get it. I'm sorry, Lord. Again, please forgive me. So when Paul says, wait, (laughs) my reaction is, isn't there another way? (laughs) No. No, it really isn't. This is Paul's application for us tying our response to his revelation. Paul says, wait, wait patiently. 
in verse 19, he says, the whole creation waits, now you wait. And then he says, we're to live in the hope of this glory. Look at verse 24, and he says, for in this hope we were saved. In this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So the waiting we are called to display is not a joyless, lifeless, resigning to fate. It's not like waiting in a dentist's office. It's waiting in verse 19 in eager expectation and in verse 24 in hope. And hope in the Bible is not our hope. It's much more significant. It's much fuller than that. It's not I hope so, it's no so, it's not it might be, it's it will be. It's not the checks in the mail, it's the money is in the bank. That's our hope. And the Bible talks so often of our hope. Prophets, patriarchs, and apostles speak of our hope. Peter, Paul, John, Jude, James. My friend, Jesus is coming, and when he does, we're going to be changed. Fashioned like unto his glorious body, the groaning is over, and the glory begins. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the assurance of our hope, the blessed assurance about which your church has sung for ages. And yet it is a blessed assurance that never wanes or weakens, but only grows stronger in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the substance of our hope. We thank you for the faith that has been gifted to every believer, every follower of Christ. We thank you that we look at this world and we assess it and we see all that's amiss in it, and we can have the confident assurance that we overcome this world, for this is that which overcomes the world, even our faith. Yes, Lord, we live in that present reality that Paul has presented to us, that world of suffering and frustration and groaning. And yet the day is most assuredly coming for every follower of Christ that we go from groaning to glory. And Lord, we just want to thank you for that tonight. And may our hearts be open to you for even greater confirmation in our lives of our assurance and our hope as we walk before you in this world. 